Now we're talking about electron structure correlation and non permeability scattering in layers nicolates and cuprates. Um, more of the time we'll be on cuprates, nicolates will be at the end. These are layer nicolates, they are not superconducting, but uh, there's a lot of uh, new information from the archive. So we'll be talking about not just the electron structure, but especially the electron self energy. And we're, work, we're working very hard to turn ARPEZ into what I'm calling a self energy spectroscopy, where we get scattering rates, mass enhancements, and plus plus uh, versus frequency, temperature, momentum, doping, et cetera. Um, yeah, so this is our campus. Here, uh, this is our backdrop. Um, I should comment, you know, with so many people here from Flatiron Institute, uh, these things here, I would say, are the original flat irons. These are these guys here. And flat irons. It's actually a guy Steve Dow, one of these two years ago. You look at this. Um, okay, and uh, the main team, a um, few of my grad students and postdocs, these are uh, we're both doing cuprates and uh, nicolate work here. The cuprate samples, just those samples came from Helmut Berger and from Ben Blue Group. And the, um, the new layered, uh, these are triple layer um, nicolate samples that from John Nichols Group that are done. Okay, so these are the three topics for our upper measurements. I'm gonna start with the nodal electron normal state scattering rates in cuprates. Uh, there's what we show is our power law liquid scattering rate. So we're all very familiar with the linear and omega and T scattering. Uh, we argue this is only linear at um, optimal doping, sublinear uh, for under doping, and uh, beyond linear, supralinear. Uh, eventually, of course, we understand extrapolating to quadratic from liquid like. Um, Talk about this clunky scattering, non quasi particles. Uh, there's a lot of excitement about this SYK or SYK, the Kyle model that maps very well to what we're finding. Uh, so, this is nodal and this is just normal state. Then I'll move into a self energy analysis across the entire Brian zone, and including the normal and sigmoid state. Uh, we need to go beyond these one dimensional MDCs and EDCs, or momentum distribution curves and energy distribution curves, which can the mainstay. For the past decade um, uh, of our analysis, and so we go to a true two dimensional thing where everything happens together. And this is really where I'm talking about our as a bit. Now we're evolving into a self energy spectroscopy, and then I'll talk about these nicolates. Uh, we call them the four, three, eight tri layer. So three nicolates here, and these are very close analogs to the uh, The same DX with my y squared orbitals is similar from such a topology. We don't seem to have this extra. Uh, 5D electron pocket in these, um, um, but they haven't been taken superconducting yet. It's very hard to dope them away. They're basically lime compounds. Okay, so um, let's see. It's Arpez. I don't need to spend too much time for this uh, group here, but very quickly, photon in, electron out. We know the energy of the photons. We measure the energy of the ejected electrons through kinematics, measuring the angles, etc. We can get uh, band positions as a function of kx, k, y, x, k, z. So what most people on the computer are doing is they're doing band map, mapping or peak tracking, you know? You watch this person say that's a direct point. Um, we're, we've been working very hard over the last number of years to go much beyond that. So we get at uh, the band broadening and band renormalizations and all this is uh, contained in the spectral function. Uh, and for this group, again, you're very familiar with this, um, really after the self-energy, to the prime, the real and imaginary parts, basically the imaginary part uh, broadens it, the real part shifts, or renormalizes the band energies. Uh, this would be a uh, Lorentzian if the self-energy, sigma prime double prime, were not frequency dependent. Uh, if there was no omega dependence, that's the Lorentzian, that's sort of what you for a lifetime broadening, but with an omega defense, as there is in these healthcare systems, these get distorted, and that's one reason uh, really understanding these has been very difficult. Okay. Uh, so um, let me move forward to the nodal normal state scattering and cuprates. Uh, this is BISCO, is the famous favorite material for 
uh, spectroscopy and scoop rates, uh, largely because it's beautiful as cleaves. So um, here's your grand zone, here's your nodes electrons, so the geo gap is largest here. These have the largest Fermi velocity, they dominate the transports. Uh, we heard this um, from Louis yesterday, similarly. Uh, so this is an ARPES measurement along this green cut here. So energy versus K, here's the Fermi energy. On uh, dispersion in this guy would come way down here, the, some sort of parabolic band. We bring your Fermi energy, this is raw data. And in this case, um, it's fair for me to use just MDCs, and that's because the dispersion is very linear. I won't need to do this. Change your 2D spectroscopy that I'll talk about after this. And so the measurements here were just taking many cuts, and we're looking at the widths of these, delta K of these MDCs in inverse entrance. You can see it's sharper here, broader here, sharper, broader. Um, you might think it looks linear here and looking quadratic here. I want to say that's not really the, I don't believe the proper way to look at the data. I'll tell you more about that. Um, anyway, this is one cut uh, at one temperature, one sample. And now here is many different doping levels from underdope, optimal dope, to overdope at many different temperatures. And then there's many families that we put together. Okay. Uh, at low temperature, there's lower scattering rates or lower sigma double prime or lower momentum widths of these cuts in momentum. Okay, so you take the momentum width, you multiply by the bare Fermi velocity, and you get sigma double time. Um, so all of this is in the normal state, because I don't want to worry about uh, the effect of superconductivity. I'll see that in the next set of slides. Um, so there's a full family here, and in black dash are fits to these. Uh, I'm not fitting any one curve Separately, I'm putting everything simultaneously, the entire family. And the fits are quite good, and I'll show you more details about that. Uh, so there's many more constraints on me fitting the whole family together. And this, I think, is the first time this has been done in ARPES. Uh, let me show you what we fit to. We fit to an ansatz for what sigma double prime should do. We call this the power law liquid phenomenology. Uh, so as a function of frequency or temperature, it's sort of an internal quadratic thing, but then raised to some exponent, that's our power law. And um, with something that connects the two scales, uh, an offset, a coupling term, and then I'll show you about this later. Uh, here's the data, this is the same as on the last slide. Uh, so again, I put everything together. Uh, let's just pick out, say, optimal dope sample. So this is our standard max TC curve, so the green is TC. Here, I would pull an alpha term of 0.5, okay? So something squared to the 0.5 is linear. Something squared to the 0.5 is linear. So it's linear in omega and linear in T, both, okay? I'm measuring in omega and in T, both. And that's all simultaneous. Okay, and you can see for the many different samples, the many different dopings, there's different families of this evolution. So let's look more closely. This beta thing that couples omega and t, that's scattered around pi. Okay. Theoretically, for a Fermi liquid, beta is supposed to be pi. And these are not Fermi liquids, but that's um, from, uh, expected from Matsubara now, I'm just working on that uh, time, okay? So um, that's just from the fits, that's not um, enforced. Lambda, this coupling thing that says, okay, it's linear in T or something near that. Well, how fast does it go linear in T? That's my coupling parameter, lambda, and coupling parameter. I find that's essentially doping independent on 0.5. And this is basically this Planckian dissertation, um, but more details on it. This is a very pleasant device for this. Uh, this is so constant. Um, and then everything else just comes linear. This, this key thing then is alpha. That's the thing that's varying. I already showed you that goes to 0.5. If you extrapolate to much higher doping, eventually imagine this might come to one and that would be a Fermi liquid, quadratic and omega quadratic in T scattering. Um, and there's a gamma knot, some impurity scattering. I already showed you where those are in the data. Those do bounce around a little bit. 
it's an offset. Um, yes. Ah, omega n. Great. That was the last thing I was going to say. Um, this is okay. First of all, this is here to make my units work. Okay, because this is energy omega h bar omega. Uh, this needs to be energy. I but as this alpha varies, I need to keep this in energy units. So omega n is something we put in, and we put it in as a very large number. I think it's 0.5 eV for us, but it is essentially, essentially dropped out. Let's just go to the case alpha is um, 0.5. Two times 0.5 is one, minus one is to zero, completely dropped out there. Okay, I mean, something to keep the units right, and we try to variety of values. It does matter a little bit here and here, but only very weakly. Yes. There is a, a little bit of help there. Okay, so we have all this data from um, many temperatures, many frequencies, etc. Uh, we scale them according to this thing inside here. And I call that thing inside C squared. There's a thing inside uh, for the different dopings. And all the different temperature curves here now hold onto one set of lines if I do a log log plot. And the log log plot, we know the slope of this is the power law exponent. And um, so the many, many different cuts, you see they, they're overlapping here, but they all fall on the same line. And you see the slopes with my alpha varies smoothly from overdose to optimal dose to underdose. So it's about 0.5. Okay. Um, so that's what the data shows. Here's just seems what it like. Use that formula, this I call it parallel liquid formula. To take it to the various limits. Here's limit alpha equals one. That's pure quadratic. And this is what you expect here. Sigma double prime, the scattering rate goes quadratically. Uh, this is uh, the alpha equals half. This is the linear in omega, linear in T. And I'm just plotting what I expect from the double prime to do versus frequency. This is 100 Kelvin. And the uh, plot is the red guy. You would say this looks linear. And this looks quadratic. You might think that means that this is firmly liquid light, um, but it's not. It's explicitly linear. Uh, and we have this S shaped thing here uh, for the underdose region. Again, it looks sort of quadratic like and looks sort of linear like. But uh, so looking at one portion, we would argue, is not sufficient to uh, understand these forms. Uh, of course, with this, form of the self-energy, I can plot versus any doping now. Remember, the power law exponent is linear in uh, doping. So these are different doping levels. I can plot versus temperature. Um, and here, single double prime at uh, omega equals zero. And here's the family I get from overdose to near optimal, because optimal is fully linear, and then underdose. And with these, and then we also measure from velocities and whatnot around the Fermi surface, we can calculate the resistivity uh, using a certain number of approximations, either a Boltzmann type model, a Judas type model, and see the that calculated resistivity from the RPEZ, and this is measured resistivity. And I want to comment the scales here are the same. This is a thousand micro ohm centimeters. This is the same temperature scale. And these are roughly the same doping ranges. And so while I'm not perfect, I think it's very satisfactory. Um, maybe surprisingly good. Okay, so I think I want to move a little forward. Okay, so with this, we can also calculate uh, optical conductivity. This is done at 300 Kelvin. Uh, so this is sigma uh, one versus wave number. This is at 300 Kelvin for different doping. Here, it looks like there's some gruda like peaks, um, but it's not, they're not real fuzzy. It's not from the good. And I can compare it to experimental measurements of the same, again, with the same scale, 2000 and 1000, et cetera, in the doping level. Um, so you might think these are um, 
do the like or something. But if I take my formula and go exactly to temperature zero uh, and frequency zero, I can actually directly extract the quasi particle residue. And below 0.5 in the indigo is precisely zero. You know, I have spectral like things in my archive data. Uh, there is a quasi particle residue, but I would not call these. Uh, Fermi liquid or anything like that. The Fermi liquid limit would only be way out here. All right, I want to move to my next. Uh, okay, uh, okay, so last comment. So this is called the power law liquid. I would like to call this a quantum critical phase rather than a quantum critical point. Everywhere we're looking in doping, there's this behavior it's very smoothly. Um, and so some of this type of physics may be going on in some of these models. Um, and of course, the country born out of state, so we want to try to understand this, or maybe understand this in detail. Okay, let me move to the next set of data and analysis. So, across the entire Brion zone. And um, let's see, uh, in the nodal data, the space was slight, the dispersion was very linear. It's easy to do the analysis though. As we move around the Brian zone, especially towards the anti node, the uh, spectral dispersion gets uh, no longer linear. There's a lot of um, curvature here. Uh, there's a lot of running. The self energies get large. And the community's had a hard time how to deal with it. So, this is uh, from Jet Shen's work back in 2004. He shows you if I take external data, this is in the two minute state of this go. Uh, if I take EDC cuts in red, I get this kind of dispersion here. If I take MGC cuts and look where the peaks are, I get this type of dispersion. Qualitatively, they're extremely different. Um, and so then you're going to kind of use this and try to get velocities and gap values and whatnot. It's, it's very difficult. Okay. Uh, so this is where the city art was until the past year where we realize we need to go beyond 1D analysis and do a full two-dimensional analysis, deal with both um, MDCs and EDCs simultaneously. Uh, and from this, we obtain the bare band dispersion, gaps, and a fully causal self-energy. We get sigma prime and sigma double prime simultaneously. So we're getting these details with one particle electron interactions. We're actually doing it with fits that have orders of magnitude fewer free parameters. Okay, so here's um, ARPED data. Uh, I'll show you more details where this comes from, but this is um, in the United state on a PC85 sample, uh, somewhere in the mid zone. This is super much in gap here, and this color scale stuff, this is fit to this data. Okay, what goes into the fit? Well, there's a bare band shown in red dots, a parabolic thing. Um, which is here, and basically what we're fitting to is this non Gorkov Green's function. So here's the um, bare dispersion, F1 K, here's the self energy, and here's the pairing term. Okay. And uh, in the ARPES, we're looking at the spectral function, which is the manual part of V1Y. Um, this side. And of course, phi uh, is the gap renormalized with this parameter Z, which is one minus sigma. Ah, uh, this is a resolution function that we can independently determine. And so we can follow the resolution function while we're doing the Okay, uh, the data I showed you previously showed you in the last slide was this data here. Uh, all external data and fits is one part in the Brian zone, but it's a minus KF and plus KF. Um, and here's many temperatures, all on that one fit, on that one slice, I'm sorry. And um, to, uh, let's see, to do this, I already showed you we need to extract a bare band, which is a parabolic thing. And here I show you for all the temperatures, the bare band we extract is the same. Okay, we didn't force that, we found them. Okay, and because it's bare, it shouldn't care about the temperature. Uh, you can see as you warm up, as you go across DC, which is around here, these spectral features are quite broad. Okay, so five more. Oh, thank you. 
um, there's um, lots of broadening, so sigma double prime at high temperatures is large, uh, especially at deeper binding energies with a Fermi energy here. So let me show you, um, let's say I'm at 50 millivolts, somewhere around here, I'm at 200 K, my sigma double prime is over 100 millivolts. That's definitely non quasi particle light. Okay, but at low temperatures in the region and low frequencies, I have a drastic dropping of sigma double prime. Along with that, I have a peaking in sigma prime, and this happens because of causality, because of Thomas Cronin. And these are constraints that go together. So just, maybe there's one of the main messages. As I go through nothing, I have a huge drop in sigma double prime. Of course, there's a gapping of the spectral weight as well. Uh, these are the sigma prime and sigma double prime as a function of temperature and frequency that make each of these fits that are all working extremely well. I can do this. Um, well, those are 2D fits. If I look at 1D lines of EDCs or MDCs, uh, the red is the external data, the black are the fits. They're not perfect, but they're actually extremely good. They're better than I could do from a single EDC or MDC because of the asymmetry. Um, if I try to fit this asymmetric thing with a Lorentzian as I typically do, I have problems. I need to put an artificial background in. That doesn't come here. Uh, and I've ordered many to fewer free parameters. So we, we're very happy with how this works. We do it as a function of momentum throughout the Brion zone. Here's near the node. The self energies are much smaller. If I go to the anti node, the self energies are huge. Here's 300 some millivolts at 50 some millivolts. So that's huge. Uh, sigma double prime compared to energy, extremely non quasi particle light. Uh, along with that is a huge effect on sigma prime. This gives these kinks and, and whatnot, and extremely flat bands. Um, so my time is a little tight. I can say uh, what we observe is the function of temperature, there's a transfer conversion of this huge sigma double prime to a sigma prime. So a inco from an incoherent thing to a coherent thing. Pat starts slightly above TC uh, at about a parent temperature, about some 20 Kelvin above. And um, there's details of this. We believe it gives positive feedback uh, onto the pairing that can help strengthen uh, pairing mechanisms, um, but uh, more work needs to be done on this. Okay, in the last few minutes, I wanna go to the nicolates. And uh, so let's see, um, we are working with uh, also hydrogenated samples. They start as single crystals of a four to 10, three nickel oxygen layers. Uh, Don Mitchell, who works with us, is able to remove oxygen with the four to eight aligned compounds. If you just count uh, from valences, you expect the doping level would be here, slightly over doped, something like 8.6. And I'm overlaying that on the cuprate doping phase diagram. Uh, here's Arbez on it. These are Fermi surfaces and plus slight 100 millivolts below. Um, we're using two photon energies to pick out various parts of the electron structure. Uh, you can see sort of like hole like things here, electron like things here. We put them all together, and this is what we get. And I'm comparing to uh, an overdose disco. Uh, Fermi surface with bilayer splitting. Here's a trilayer splitting. So there's a dashed one here that's hard for us to explicitly resolve. And here's the FT of this again, one, two, three of these bands because it's a triple layer uh, nicolate. And that's very similar to cuprate if you like nodal and anti nodal states. I can go into more detail and show you the E versus K, which is not yet published. Uh, so cut. One is along here, cut two would be like your nodal cut, um, and then cut three would be like anti-nodal. So here's the raw data. These red lines are fits to the peak position through the data. These are just MDCs for now. That dispersion is shown here, experimental dispersion, and I overlay that with the DFT. Okay, so you can see KF matches extremely well, like you'd expect in a uh, type of liquid type thing. The volume from surface volume, but the masses are heavier in the experimental data. And that's sort of what we are used to from cuprates. 
Uh, let's see. I can do symmetry analysis by varying my photon polarization from P to S. There's details about this using mirror planes and whatnot. The upside is you find that this is dominated by the GX squared minus Y squared space, and then also with the GX So uh, Let's see. Last slide is on scattering rates. This is the, called the nodal cuts. This is the experimental data, sigma double prime versus frequency. Here's the Fermi energy. The yellow squares are the experimental data. And I fit this to either a Fermi liquid type of analysis, doesn't do such a great job. Marginal Fermi liquid at zero temperature would be perfectly linear, but I'm at finite temperature, I'm at 22K. And that is the black dash line that fits quite nicely. Okay, so sort of a linear thing here, and quadratic like if you like, um, but really just marginal Fermi liquid all the way. And here's transport data, uh, normalized resistance versus temperature. Now, this is versus frequency, this is for temperature. It's not really arbitrary because I know how to connect them with this beta term or roughly pi. I a t squared of this scale is roughly uh, omega squared on this scale. So roughly the same. And again, we do, I just compare the quadratic and the linear and you can see the scattering rates are quite similar between them. Okay, I think this is my last slide. Uh, thank you for your attention. All right, let's dive right into the questions. I'll repeat the questions while even then. Okay. Yeah. Harold. Do you recommend using the conference or the Ah, yes. Okay, wait, so the, yes. the question no. is about the filling level of the inner layer versus the outer layer. They're certainly different. Um, and um, the two outer layers, there's one filling level of the, from, from the um, DFT. And I don't remember the full details, but um, they're definitely different. And um, yeah, I, I don't want to say where it is now. We've looked at it, I just don't remember the full details. But um, from what we can tell, because the ARPA's Fermi surface closely matches the GFT Fermi surface, I think volumes, et cetera, I, I think the GFT is probably correct. In the back. Okay, so the, que the question is about the quasi-particle pole and uh, quasi-particle residue and what happens when you don't have a single pole, how do you define that? Right, so um, analytically we can access this also numerically, uh, but there is no pole here. There is no residue, it's a, it's a branch cut. Um, yeah, so there is no pole, that's why alpha is zero. It's still some peakiness to the spectra. I should say, if you go away from t equals zero, you go to one millikelvin, uh, this is now fine. Calculate that, and I, I can sit down with you, I can show you details. And it's worked out in detail in the supplementary material. Of, uh, yeah. Yes, but there's one parameter that really dominates. Yes. Okay, wait. So what's uh, the yeah. question? The question yeah. is, is it a four parameter fit? Okay, so the question is what other four parameter fits were tried before arriving at the yeah, current yeah, yeah. one? So, um, well, the main thing we tried uh, in comparison was kind of do a superposition of a linear and a quadratic. Uh, and this has been used in literature um, and um, we found that did not work so well, especially difficult for us to get the S-shaped um, conductivity here. Uh, uh, no, I don't think it is because there's parameters in each of those in the 
from the liquid part and the merge from the liquid part, there's parameters in each of those and then a, a, a waving. Uh, of, of course, we uh, I cannot say that we are not exhaustive. Those are the, the main two that we looked at. Okay, one last question. something else. One last question. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So there's two things you need cut off. Okay, wait, so the question is about Kramer's chronic yeah. and uh, what do you do because you need all frequencies? Yes, yes. So um, first you need to cut off some deep energy and uh, we go quite deep. We go well past the bottom of the band, which is about a half a volt. If you go to half a volt or a volt, there's very minor differences. Um, and then there's the negative versus positive frequency side. And um, we're only probing the negative frequency or the, the um, binding side. Uh, so we uh, looked at the first thing is symmetrized scattering rate, not the electron structure, not the band dispersion. So we can symmetrize the um, self energy. Sigma double prime should be even, and sigma double prime should be odd. And then put some canting one side versus the other, and look at a variety of possible cantings with basically form similar on both sides. We find we get the best result with the symmetric. Um, but this is all uncharted territory. Um, and um, so it is the right that we don't have full control of the unoccupied side of it. Um, but the zeroth order, we find, we find the best result if there's Okay, great. Thanks, Phil. Let's just let's continue okay. this discussion yeah. with Harold and Dan during the break, and uh, uh, we are going to stop and have our coffee break now until nine thirty. Yeah.